Good morning. Happy Dyslexia Awareness Month and welcome to the third webinar of our special series, Dyslexia, Lighting the Path to Literacy. My name is Judy Cohen and I'm the current president of the International Dyslexia Association, Florida Branch. On behalf of our entire board, I want to welcome you to this webinar and thank you for taking time from your Saturday to join us. We are very happy to have the Gauss School and Decoding Dyslexia as our sponsors for today's event. To start, a few housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted, but feel free to use the Q&A tool throughout the session. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. This session is being recorded and resource documents will be available soon. Today's session is equipped for reading success and overview. In this session, our presenters will provide an overview of the hugely popular book and phonological awareness training curriculum, Equipped for Reading Success, written by Dr. David Kilpatrick. We also want you to know that there will be a book study series um, during November and December for those participants who wish to delve deeper into this resource. Details will, will be provided later in the uh, webinar. Also, if you are one of the first 20 residents to, to join IDA at the professional level in October, you'll also receive a free copy of Dr. Kilpatrick's book, Equipped for Reading Success. In addition, five lucky participants who stay to the end of the webinar and complete the survey will also receive a copy of this amazing resource. Now, before we begin, I'd like to tell you about our presenters. Jesse Steiff is a licensed and nationally certified school psychologist working in both private practice and the public schools in the Tampa Bay area. He has dedicated his career to working with families and children with dyslexia and other learning differences. He is an active member of the National Association of School Psychologists and the International Dyslexia Association. His areas of expertise include assessment and remediation of dyslexia and other specific learning disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disabilities, and other conditions that may affect an individual's ability to learn. He has presented numerous workshops for parents, teachers, and administrators on topics including phonological awareness, assessment, and intervention, the simple view of reading as an instructional framework, anxiety and attention difficulties in children with dyslexia, and navigating the response to intervention process for parents. Jesse is passionate about bridging the gap between research and practice in order to improve educational and mental health outcomes for all children, regardless of circumstance. He holds a bachelor's degree and Florida State certification in elementary education and an educational specialist degree in school psychology, both from the University of Central Florida. He currently lives in the Tampa Bay area with his wife and is an avid home cook and voracious reader. Cassandra Murphy Atkins has been a teacher for almost 15 years and is currently the first in her large school district to be in the position of instructional staff developer for dyslexia. Prior to this position, she taught students in a variety of special education capacities and was also an instructional coach responsible for implementing the district's Springboard to Success program, a training and onboarding program for new teachers. She holds a master's degree in curriculum and instruction and has worked to remediate students reading in grades one through 12. She is a passionate advocate for all students and particularly for students with language-based learning disabilities. She has dedicated her career to working with teachers to develop their capacity to teach all students. Personally, Cassandra has dyslexia herself and her child as well. She is proud of the fact that they have both been remediated through structured literacy based instruction. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Jesse and Cassandra. Thank you very much, Judy. We really appreciate that really warm welcome. Um, and thank you to thank you to IDA for, for hosting this presentation. And thank you to our sponsors, the Gauss School and, um, and Decoding Dyslexia. So we're going to talk uh, today about um, Equipped for Reading Success. And um, Cassandra and I are going to kind of go, go back and forth um, here talking about a little bit of research and a little bit of practice. Uh, so let's, let's kind of talk about um, our kind of framing today's work. So 
you know, this book is an absolute wealth of information and it's kind of next to impossible to cover it all in two and a half hours. You know, it's, it's both a curriculum and a book about the, uh, the development of word reading skills. So, you know, what we've done here today is kind of our best to, to take what we think are some of the most important concepts in the book and to present them to you in a way that maybe your interest is piqued uh, enough to go and read the whole thing yourself. Um, and when you do, you'll have a solid foundation um, to kind of layer, uh, uh, to layer all the extra goodies that are on in, in the book. Um, so again, kind of just a, an introductory exposure to the main topics, because we can't, we couldn't possibly cover everything in one, in one presentation. And thank you to everyone for spending a Saturday, uh, Saturday afternoon here learning about orthographic mapping and, and reading skills. You know, it's, uh, uh, these are busy times and we appreciate everyone's, um, everyone's time. So, you know, this is not a book specifically a revolving around dyslexia. Um, so we're not going to spend, you know, time talking about the basics of what dyslexia is and what it isn't. You know, there's already so much good content out there um, about that from IDA and from a ton of other organizations. But we do want to kind of set the stage and say that the concepts that are presented in Equipped uh, for Reading Success you know, and the phonological awareness training is absolutely directly applicable to students with dyslexia. You know, dyslexia is at its core an unexpected difficulty with accurate and fluent word decoding and spelling due to a deficit in the phonological component of language, right? You know, so we're gonna be talking about how um, effortless and automatic word recognition develops and how phonological awareness and specifically phonemic proficiency uh, contributes to that and how to develop it in your students. So we kind of want to start out with a with some statistics as, as the book starts out. And this continuum of skill uh, refers largely to students' abilities in phonological awareness. The top 60% of students will generally be able to read fluently regardless of the literacy approach that's taught to them with enough exposure to a variety of text and text and activities. But we do want to be really, really careful here in saying that, you know, this is the figure that Dr. Kilpatrick cites. And, um, you know, that can certainly vary depending on the particular research study that's being examined or that is examining these proportions um, and certainly the populations that you serve. So we'll kind of continue to reference this 60% figure, but we just want to be really explicit um, in saying that there's not like a cut and dried figure. And, and this varies tremendously from school to school and depending on the, the, the study that's being cited. But you know, the, but the bottom 40%, um, again, proportions vary, but it's never less than 40% in much of the time, significantly more, um, will require explicit systematic training in phonological awareness and foundation skill, foundational skills in order to either say reach their potential and in the case of the bottom 10 to 15%, in order to be functional readers at all. And this visual uh, applies to, to all students, you know, regardless of age, right? We tend to move on from phonological awareness instruction after about K1, if you're, if you're lucky. Um, however, phonological awareness deficits can and absolutely do persist and continue to impede a student's ability to read regardless of their age. And this is the case whether you're eight years old or you're 58 years old. You know, and we know through experimental research that when adults' phonological awareness deficits are remediated and they're taught systematically with code-based systematic reading instruction that their word reading accuracy and fluency, you know, it improves substantially and even normalizes in most cases, in many cases. So, Here's our first kind of uh, interactive uh, attempt to interact with the, with the audience here. Um, so we want to take a second to, uh, to react to this quote. I know we have in the chat here, but we weren't, we weren't quite able to get our chat function working. So uh, maybe some people might be brave and, and unmute themselves. But um, let's take a, let's read this quote. Prevention studies show that 70 to 90% of all at-risk children in K2 can learn to read in the average range if provided with early and systematic instruction in key reading skills. You know, take a second, kind of chew that over. 
you know, does this, does this resonate with you? Do you believe it to be true? Have you seen it in action? Um, you know, what do, what do we think about? So we may, we may, have, we might not all be, maybe we have some bashful people or um, I don't know if the chat function or if the, I mean, I know the chat function's not working, but I don't know if we can unmute ourselves, uh, but that's okay. Um, you know, this, this quote is, is based on, on K2 prevention, um, prevention research that's cited in Equip for Reading Success um, and across a lot of different venues that show that you know, specific kinds of systematic, explicit, sequential instruction, particularly in phonological awareness and letter sound correspondences, you know, it, this leads to the vast majority of our primary age students being able to read in the average range. And this is, you know, this isn't just 70 to 90 percent of all readers, this is 70 to 90 percent of at-risk readers, huge proportion. All right. So, you know, why is it that such a, a huge proportion of students um, are not reading proficiently in this country, you know, particularly because we've known for, for many decades what it, what it takes to be a proficient reader, right? Um, well, you know, there's, there's often very little communication between researchers and practitioners, you know, and that, that void of communication has been filled in, in many places, unfortunately, by you know, programming and professional development that is not in alignment with what we know to be true about, about reading acquisition. You know, but of course we wanna be, you know, really clear here that teachers and practitioners who are, uh, who are not aware of this gap and are maybe implementing ineffective instructional practices, you know, they're certainly acting on good faith on the knowledge that they've been given in, in their professional development experiences. And, and certainly there's variation in the depth and quality of, of teacher education programs. Um, you know, with some universities doing an absolutely amazing job and some that simply do not. Uh, you know, in Florida, we actually, we do have some pretty exceptional institutions here compared to many other states. You know, the University of Florida has fantastic programs um, and professional development. And we have the Florida Center for Reading Research out of FSU. You know, so Florida leads the way in a lot of, um, in a lot of ways with teacher training. Um, but you know, whether or not your school or your, your teachers are, are using research aligned curriculum, you know, teachers to a person only want to improve the lives of their students and are, and are acting in good faith um, on the information and the PD that they've been given. So um, a little bit more, you know, the mark of the proficient reader is the ability to store words in memory so that they are effortlessly and automatically retrieved when reading. You know, and, and we know a lot about what's going on under the hood, as it were, um, with how this storage process actually works. You know, reading is, is probably the single most studied mental process um, in, in, in cognitive psychology, but you know, the fact remains that many of the most ubiquitous reading programs across the country are not based in what we know, um, accurate and fluent word reading skills and how, and how they actually develop. You know, so you have things like the three queuing system and whole word memorization strategies. Those things continue to be really popular um, despite a literal mountain of evidence that contradicts how foundational reading skills is taught in, the, in those types of programs. Um, but but nicely, there has been a, a shift, certainly in the past few years, thanks to the work of many researchers and organizations and journalists and individuals kind of dedicated to improving their practice and informing themselves. So, you know, we, we have a, um, a varying level of background knowledge and experience here in this group. We have over 300 people who have registered and thank you so much. Um, so within that, there's, there's certainly um, varying levels of knowledge. So we wanted to, to take a bit of time here, um, as the book also does, to clarify some terms kind of at the outset. So orthographic mapping 
is the process by which words and word parts um, are stored in memory for later immediate effortless retrieval. You know, being a good orthographic mapper is the mark of the proficient reader and being a poor orthographic mapper causes difficulties in reading accuracy and reading fluency. You know, the word orthography refers to our knowledge of the precise letter order in words. You know, we develop memories for this letter order, uh, which is referred to as orthographic memory. You know, and we have two different levels of orthographic memory precision. Uh, there is the orthographic memory that is necessary to automatically recognize and differentiate the words that we read off of a page. And, you know, we would use this level of, of memory to, for example, say automatically differentiate between the words table and tablet, right? Very close in, very close in their sequence of letters, but we immediately can differentiate between those two things. Um, and there's also a more complex level of orthographic memory that allows us to retrieve or spell words based on their precise order of letters. So like spelling is a lot more difficult for many kids than, than word decoding or word recognition. And this higher level of complexity is the reason why maybe I as a proficient adult reader can automatically recognize a really kind of complex and irregular and uh, word like rendezvous when I'm reading it, but I'm gonna have a heck of a time spelling that. Um, you know, and believe it or not, phonemic awareness is actually one of the main linguistic skills that underlie this process of orthographic mapping and orthographic memory. We also want to clarify word identification versus word recognition. You know, word identification involves sounding out or decoding a word using your knowledge of letter sound correspondences and your phonological blending skills. You know, identifying an unfamiliar word requires thought and conscious mental effort. Um, you know, in many of our kiddos with dyslexia and, and word reading difficulties, most words have to be uh, identified pretty laboriously, right? Decoded word sound by sound or chunk by chunk, which naturally causes a lot of problems and, and frustration over time. But word recognition, on the other hand, involves immediately, immediate and effortless retrieval um, of that word without it having to be decoded. And this is the ultimate goal of word reading instruction. You know, if a word has been orthographically mapped to memory, it's familiar, it's instantly recognizable with no conscious effort. And this is why orthographic mapping needs to be a central focus um, of our reading instruction. All right, microphone. Um, so, the so there is a difference between phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. So phonological awareness is kind of a large umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different skills that are related to your awareness of the sound structure of spoken language um, and includes skills like rhyming and alliteration and syllabication um, and phonemic awareness. And phonemic awareness um, is a suite of skills under that larger umbrella of phonological awareness and has to do with our ability to register and manipulate the individual uh, irreducible sounds that comprise words. And phonemic awareness is by far the most important of the phonological awareness skills after about midway through kindergarten. And it's really phonemic awareness that should be the focus of our instruction from mid kindergarten and onward. And, and so what is, what is a phoneme? Um, a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound in oral language. You know, it's, it's different than a letter. Um, but letters were created specifically to map onto our phonemes, although there's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, between the number of phonemes in a spoken word and the number of letters in a written word. Um, and of course, the major, major purpose of reading instruction is teaching students to understand how the sequences of phonemes in a word's spoken pronunciation relates to the sequence of letters in the word's written form. So what is the difference between phonics and phonological awareness? We often survey teachers during, during our professional development, and, and we do see some continued misunderstanding um, about what the difference is between the two. So phonics has to do with printed word, with printed language, right, letters. Um, it deals with letters and the various sounds that are represented by those letters. And it's also, it's also a strategy 
that we teach to students for sounding out and spelling words, right? Whereas phonological awareness has to do only with the oral sounds in a spoken word, right? Nothing to do with letters. It's a, it's a linguistic skill. It's a mental linguistic skill. And we can, so we can do phonological awareness with our eyes closed. We can't do phonics with our eyes closed. You know, and there, but there are, <laughs> there are many um, areas of phonological instruction that can be supported by using letters as scaffolds and bridges into how phonics works. You know, particularly at the early stages of phonological uh, awareness instruction, you know, and we have to take this really abstract skill of breaking words down into little sounds that our, that our kiddos have, are not used to and to make it as concrete as possible. So just a quick word about the simple view of reading as, as equipped for reading success does, you know, does go into this. And, you know, and this, but this is another topic that has gotten some really excellent and wide ranging coverage during this kind of real rich period in online reading professional development. So we're gonna take just a little, just a little bit to talk about it. Um, and the simple view posits that reading comprehension is actually the product of the interaction of two components. Yeah, language comprehension or the ability to derive meaning from oral language and that involves things like spoken vocabulary and background knowledge and knowledge of syntax and semantics um, and, and word recognition or the ability to accurately and quickly read words, um, which itself involves multiple skills like our phonological awareness and our knowledge of letter sound correspondences. So the interaction between the two components produces understanding of text, right? Both components are equally important for good reading comprehension and problems in either one of those components will necessarily cause comprehension problems. Um, you know, the interaction of the two broad composite skills produces several types of reading difficulties actually that we can, that we can kind of visualize on the next slide. So linguistic comprehension and word reading skills are both broad skills that exist on a continuum um, from very poor to very good and everywhere in between. So with this continuum sort of plotted along an X and Y axis for each of those two categories, um, we get this four, this four section chart uh, emerges and it does a really good job of describing the profiles of reading difficulties that emerge based on this simple view framework. And in the upper right hand corner, we have students who are average to good in language comprehension and average to good in word reading. And these are our typically developing readers. Uh, in the bottom right, we have students who have average to good word reading skills, but average to poor linguistic comprehension. You know, so linguistic difficulties in the absence of word recognition um, difficulties will also have a pro will also lead to negative uh, impacts on reading comprehension. And we might call some of these students specific comprehension difficulties, or, or we might call them hyperlexic. Um, some of them might be on the autism spectrum. Uh, in the bottom left hand corner, we have students with both language comprehension and word reading difficulties. And these, these kiddos have, um, and adults, have perhaps the largest deficits in, in reading skill, and they require the most intensive intervention over longer periods of time, since it's, you know, since these things are, since linguistic comprehension is generally a little bit more difficult to remediate, and they have compounding effects on reading comprehension. Then in the upper left-hand corner, we have students with dyslexia and compensator types. You know, students with dyslexia and compensators exhibit difficulties in word recognition, right? Um, and, 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 word, and word identification um, and spelling and, uh, and other related skills that are, manifested, that are manifestations of phonological processing difficulties. And so their, their comprehension difficulties are due to difficulties with accurate and fluent word, word reading, right? Um, and the compensator is an interesting uh, is an interesting phenomenon. It's a it's a type a, a type of student with really with 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 very good linguistic comprehension, um, but anywhere from 
sort of mediocre to, to poor word reading and phonological skills. You know, they, they often don't get much attention in schools because their reading comprehension scores are typically average, right? Which of course is not a good situation for them to be in because their reading comprehension could actually be significantly higher and match their linguistic comprehension if their word reading skills were to improve. So, you know, in, in to kind of sum this up, word recognition difficulties and by extension, phonological difficulties are key pieces to three out of four of these, of these, of these profiles of reading difficulty. So since phonemic awareness kind of undergirds the development of word recognition, it follows that systematic training in phonemic awareness should be an important part for most students with reading difficulties. So when, so when exactly should phonological awareness be taught? Um, right out of the gate, as soon as students step foot in school in, in pre-K and kindergarten. You know, the, the universal sort of preventative approach is particularly important in these first years of school because sometimes the differences between students who will and won't go on to have phonological and reading difficulties is so small that it's not really detectable in pre-k and kindergarten you know so it's you know and this is this is like an absolutely settled and put to bed issue in in the research that phonological awareness instruction like that which appears in equipped for reading success has a powerful preventative effect on, on later reading problems. And prevention research has also proven definitively that systematic phonological awareness and synthetic phonics instruction is, benefit, is beneficial for all first and second grade students as well. Um, and, and not only that, but it leads to faster acceleration over other approaches for students who don't have reading difficulties. You know, but it is, but it is absolutely essential for students with, with reading difficulties in those later primary years. And in third grade and beyond, you know, students should be screened regularly for difficulties in phonemic awareness if they're having word reading difficulties because explicit phonemic awareness intervention is absolutely necessary for older readers with with word reading difficulties. There's no age limit after which PA intervention is gonna be ineffective. But a, a quick word about screener, because I would be remiss as a school psychologist not to talk a little bit more about assessment. Um, you know, I wanna be clear here in saying that the type of phonemic awareness screening or an assessment used with a student who's third grade or older matters a lot. You know, not all phonemic awareness screenings are, are created equal and many assessments are not actually sensitive enough to pick up on difficulties in the more advanced phonemic awareness skills um, that should be present by third grade. You know, maybe the most widely used uh, PA assessment in phonemic awareness assessment in the classroom for teachers is a phoneme segmentation fluency task. But segmentation is actually a really basic skill that many third graders or, or older students may actually do just fine on, but in fact, they, they have true phonemic awareness difficulties. It's really only the phoneme manipulation tasks like substitutions and deletions that really tap into the level of phonemic proficiency you know, that a student would need to be a proficient reader. And we'll discuss it a little later in the presentation about how the phonological awareness screening test, the PAST, that's associated with equipped for reading success uses those phony manipulations to assess students. And you know, there is, again, there's no age limit after which intervention will be, uh, will be ineffective. There are many landmark studies, mainly from, many from um, Joseph Torgerson in the early 2000s and Jack Fletcher, these are two kind of giants in the field, uh, where they provide older kids you know, and adolescents and adults with the type of intensive training that's, that this curriculum has along with systematic training in phonics, and they're able to normalize those reading functions. It's really amazing work. So by that, that we kind of got to ask the question of, of, do many kids learn to read well without phonological awareness instruction and training? And the answer is yes. You know, again, the, the proportions vary. 
Um, but there, there is a group of many students who do learn to read regardless, and I, I might actually say despite um, how they were taught. Uh, you know, sometimes the, purport, sometimes the proportion is as high as 60%. Um, many times it's quite a bit smaller. Uh, but students with phonological dif difficulties are certainly not part of this group. Uh, so, and so then the next, another question is, is there a link between intelligence and word reading ability or, or phonological awareness? Uh, no, not, not really at all. <laughs> um, so kids, we all know kids, and, and I think we are probably preaching to the choir here with, uh, with this group that kids can be perfectly smart and well above average, but still experience difficulties in, in phonological awareness and word reading skills. You know, I'm a, I'm a school psychologist and, you know, often special education teachers and general education teachers will come to me to, to consult about a student who is just not making progress and reading is just continues to be so labored and so inaccurate and so frustrating for them. And often the first thing that they might want to consider is an IQ test. And before I knew about any of this stuff, you know, I'd, I'd do the testing and invariably the kid would be typically functioning or better. Sometimes we even find out they were gifted. Um, and we kind of throw our hands up and go, well, now what do we do? You know, often though, uh, in my experience, the student's phonemic awareness had never actually been assessed in any level of instructionally relevant detail. And what you almost invariably find is that this is a student with a moderate to severe phonological deficit that's been causing their lack of progress in basic reading skills. And this is often exacerbated by maybe having gotten a steady diet of le level readers and at best incidental phonics and maybe no spelling instruction. Uh, but there was no relationship between the student's intelligence and their word reading ability. So one of the most important principles of reading instruction is this concept of systematic sequential instruction, where we explicitly guide students from simple to more complex skills, right? So in phonological awareness, this involves meeting the kids where they are and systematically scaffolding them through the levels of phonological awareness. And we're going to talk about what each one of these levels entails. So at the syllable level, students are able to kind of discriminate or, or separate different syllables within words, but they can't really yet work with the individual phonemes. At, um, at the onset rhyme level, uh, this level represents the first time a student can actually break apart a syllable. Um, and the, the onset is the first consonant sound that comes before the vowel in a syllable. And the rhyme is the part of the syllable that includes the vowel sound and any sounds that follow. Am I getting that right, Cassandra? Cassandra's always my, is always my teacher backup. Um, so, um, so like in the word cart, for example, the k is the onset and art is the rhyme. Okay. Uh, now the phoneme level is where a student actually begins to develop the awareness of all of the individual sounds that comprise a word. And, and it, which itself has a basic and an, and an advanced phoneme, an advanced level. Um, at the basic phoneme level, lower level phonemic skills like segmenting and blending develop, as well as manipulations of maybe first and last sounds um, in the word. And at the advanced phoneme level, students are able to do more complex manipulations of internal phonemes of a word. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide as we get into and, and as we get into phonemic awareness instruction. But we want to note here that the syllable and onset rhyme level of, of phonological awareness are not, they're not actually sufficient to develop any appreciable word reading and spelling skills. You know, and orthographic mapping uh, processes really start at that phoneme level and become really accelerated um, at the advanced phoneme level. So Jesse, before we dive into a little bit more content, um, we have in the chat that I thought you might want to respond to, um, specifically around uh, PA and intelligence. So is there research showing that students with intellectual disabilities need phonological awareness to learn to read? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've struggled with 
ID students acquiring even basic phonological skills? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, is, there is plenty of evidence to show that, that the same type of reading instruction and basic skills that benefits typically developing students with, with typically developing cognitive abilities benefit students with, who have intellectual disabilities as well. There's no difference between the, the reading instruction that a student with dyslexia needs versus a student who, versus a compensator versus a student with, with an intellectual disability. Good reading instruction is good reading instruction. And just, and just that, and just because a student um, has an intellectual disability doesn't mean that their word reading skills and their phonological awareness is going to be limited by their IQ. Right, so you have we have students who are who are intellectually disabled, but they are typical word readers. Now, intellectual ability may may act may significantly affect your linguistic comprehension and your reading comprehension, but word reading skills certainly are not limited um, by any means by your by your level of cognitive ability. I completely agree. I've taught lots of kids with intellectual disabilities how to read and and they can decode beautifully. They do struggle with that linguistic comprehension and complex text. Um, someone else asked, what can we do um, to talk about teachers who gaslight students um, because they're unaware of the science of reading and they perpetuate this idea that students aren't smart enough? So I feel like I'm probably good to answer that one because um, this is, I confront teacher bias and teacher expectations as part of my role. Uh, the first thing that I do is I try to come from a place of compassion and caring, even when you're frustrated. And I get frustrated a lot, which I can say here, but I can't always say it at work. Um, and I find that little four square chart to be really helpful because it allows you to kind of talk through the science of reading, but in a very visual way, and then explain that all kids have strengths and different weaknesses. Um, and I also find like there's this really great what is dyslexia TED talk. It's about five minute video that I share with teachers all the time. Um, that I think really helps. So I hope that little tips and tricks helps a lot. And then Questions? other question that I thought would be good to talk about is um, how do we feel about pushing early intervention boundaries if you wait until third grade to screen for dyslexia? How do we feel about, about how do you pushing feel early? it may be pushing the early intervention boundaries if you wait until third grade to screen for dyslexia? Oh yeah, no, we never want to wait until third grade <laughs> to, to screen for dyslexia. Um, that's the importance of a preventative approach is, is like, you know, encompasses both uh, core tier one preventative instruction, but also intervention for students who, who, are, who are not making progress, you know, through that, through that strong preventative approach that includes lots of strong word reading skills. So if that was, um, if I was unclear about that, I apologize. I'm not advocating to, uh, to wait until third grade to screen students by any means. Um, you know, so sorry about that. Yeah, we want to, we want to intervene as early as possible, um, both by, by, with strong core intervention and not waiting to provide a more intensive small group remediation for kids in, in K2 who need it. We always say an ounce of prevention is worth 10,000 pounds of prevention. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just thought we should clear those up before we moved on into the meat of the content. Great, great questions. Okay, so um, this figure is, we like to show this figure because it shows just how important phonological awareness is in driving and interacting with every level of word reading development. You know, so we have those early phonological skills, you know, the stuff that pre-K and early kindergarten are, are teaching um, that, are, that are precursors and help along the development of letter learning, um, you know, learning, learning letter names and letter sounds. So kids who are poor at these early phonological skills tend to have more difficulty learning letters and sounds. And kids who are trained in these early skills or who are proficient in them pick up on letter names and sounds a lot more quickly. So while something like visual skills absolutely do play a role in learning individual letters, you know, like we teach kids about the visual characteristics of letters, that's, that's important. 
Um, it's really the phonology that's, that's a bigger factor in determining how well or poorly kids learn letters and sounds. You know, and this is the reason why it's easier for kids to learn some letter names and sounds than others. So we have like the letter T, which is typically one of the easier ones. And that's because the, the name T starts with the same sound that the letter makes compared to a word like W or H that are much more difficult for, for our early readers to learn, where there's no connection between the name um, and the sound. Then we kind of see basic phonemic awareness skills at, at the next level, um, like segmenting and blending, and it's, and it's reciprocal relationship between basic decoding and spelling skills. You know, in, in typically developing readers, you know, these basic phonemic awareness skills emerge as a result of being taught to decode and spell, since many kids can pick up on the relationship between the letters in the written word and the phonemes in the spoken word. But in students with phonological difficulties, that is absolutely not the case. And it is essential that those skills like phoneme segmentation and blending be explicitly taught so that they're able to do those basic uh, decoding and spelling skills. And you know, segmenting and, and blending is where we typically would have stopped in the past um, with our phonemic awareness instruction. A lot of our kind of a lot of our systematic phonics programs will teach segmenting and blending. Um, and you know, they are and those you know our systematic synthetic phonics programs. They're definitely able to get students to decode words accurately, right? Yet there's always that wall of laborious decoding and disfluent reading that, that most kids who have gotten good phonics and basic phonemic awareness instruction just, just have such a hard time getting over. But we know now that there's this, that there's another level of phonological skill, which is better um, described as phonemic proficiency that allows a student to break through that wall of labored decoding and to begin and to continue to truly acquire the words that they encounter and to orthographically map those words so that they're instantly and effortlessly retrieved um, when they're reading. And this level of phonemic proficiency can't be tapped into by basic segmentation and blending um, assessments or instructional activities. And what is, you know, what this actually looks like is timed phoneme manipulation. Um, for example, uh, say the word sto, now say sto, but instead of t, say o, oh, slow. Uh, there are many students who can segment the, who can segment the word slow um, into its phonemes and blend s, o, o um, into the word, um, but they still have real phonological difficulties that are impeding their word reading. And if you give them a, a, a timed phoneme manipulation like that, that is where they truly might have a lot more difficulty. So let's dig a little bit more um, into the actual process for orthographic mapping and how to train phonemic awareness so that this process can develop more efficiently. Uh, so the term, but we want to talk about the, about the term sight word here. Um, you know, it's used in a lot of different ways in education. Um, and we think that specificity of language is really important um, for differentiating between these really these like, important concepts in reading instruction. So our definition of the term sight word and Dr. Kilpatrick's definition and that and, and many researchers definition, um, it only refers to a word that a student can effortlessly and automatically recognize. It doesn't mean an irregularly spelled word or a high frequency word, right? We all know many students for whom um, high frequency words are still not recognized by sight. And we know, and so for, some, and for someone like me or, or any other proficient built reader, the word rendezvous, very irregular, French in origin. Um, and, you know, but that is, a, that is a sight word that we can recognize automatically. Uh, so, what we believe about how sight words are developed will dictate the instructional strategies that we use to teach our students, right? So, you know, if our ability to read words quickly 
were based on visual memory, um, which it is not, uh, then we'd expect that repeated viewing of a whole word would lead uh, to that word becoming a sight word for all students, or at least students with typical visual memories. Um, and it does for many kids um, in as few as one to four viewings. But the fact that the students who consistently cannot do this and need more and more repetitions are students with phonological deficits gives us a huge piece of evidence that visual memory actually has very little or nothing to do with it. You know, visual memory, again, does play a smaller role in, in single letter learning. Um, they'll be going, because learning a letter name is, is a type of task that's called paired associate learning, learning the name for, uh, that's associated for a thing. Um, and this is partially dependent on the visual look of the letter. And so there is a place for frequent viewing of letters and instruction based on the visual look of the letter, right? But there's a, and there's a whole chapter in Equip for Reading Success on, uh, on letter learning that we won't have time to go into here today. Um, but visual memory has almost no bearing on, on word reading development. Uh, so sight word learning uh, not being based on visual memory is like totally counterintuitive, right? Because we, we have to look at the word in order to read it. Um, but there is a huge difference between visual input, physically looking at the words, and storage of the word. And we know this in a lot of ways, and we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna take the next couple of slides to kind, of, uh, to kind of go over this in a little bit more detail. Um, storage of the word is, is not based on visual memory, and, ex and experimental studies will take proficient readers um, and we'll put them in MRI machines or hook little electrodes up to their heads and have them read in order to observe the types of brain activity that happens when they do. And what we see primarily lighting up are parts of the brain that are associated with oral language, right? Um, not, in, not parts that have to do with when we visually recognize an object or a room or a face or any type of visual memory or visual processing. Now, um, you know, here's, here's another example that uh, kind of illustrates the difference between memory for written words and visual memory. So you're, you're walking down the hall at work or you're, you know, you're at a party and um, a colleague or an acquaintance comes up to you and they're like, hey, Jesse. And you go, hey, you. Uh, and you have completely blocked on their name, right? The visual of that person who you've met like eight or nine times now, it's just not activating the name of that person, even though you've been told their name like eight or nine times. Now, compare that to reading. Have you ever been reading a book and you get to a word and you're like, man, I've known that word for years. I've read it a million times. I just, I just can't read it. No, no, that's, that has happened zero times in the history of proficient reading. You know, you can't help but read a word once it's been orthographically mapped when you look at it. You know, it actually takes less time for your brain to register the written word, like the written word of the word bear, um, than it does to register the picture of a bear. So we know that these are, these are different pathways. Um, you know, studying the reading skills of students who are deaf or hard of hearing also gives us an idea for how, how reading develops. You know, as a population, students who are deaf and hard of hearing consistently show really significant difficulties in, in proficient word reading, despite normal visual capacity. You know, and on a, um, on a similar note, blind students as a population don't show the same reading problems as students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, kids who, are, who learn to read uh, via Braille and have intact phonological awareness have the same general levels of reading skill as sighted folks um, who learn to read using letters. So the input um, is tactile for students who are blind and the input is visual um, for, for folks who can see. But the way that we store words mentally has, this, has a phonological component um, you know, that is the same in both, um, in both populations, in all populations. Hey guys, so that was like the shock of the year a couple of years back for me. 
So in the chat, if you have any questions about that, please drop them. We'll try to answer them. We're going to go in a little bit more detail. But when I first started thinking about this stuff, I thought, how am I going to explain this to kids, right? Especially older students. How am I going to explain to older students why we're working on something that has no letters so they don't think it has anything to do with reading and why it's so important? So one of the things that I do to kind of illustrate this point to older readers and to little readers, I said it to first graders the other day, I said, when you're reading a story on your own, um, what, what happens in your head? Do you just picture the letters floating around and that's what you see? Or do you hear yourself saying the words? And they're like, oh, I hear myself. And I was like, right, because that's where your words are stored. Clearly I don't go into all the neuroscience behind it, but that's like a really good way to um, explain this to kids, because I think when kids understand what you're doing, they're more likely to actively participate. Talking about the visual word form area and the brain to our to our first grader students, but yes, that's it might a, be absolutely fantastic um, way to, to talk about it. Great. So there are no questions in the chat. So you guys are all with us, which I love. So we're going to keep it going. All right. So. So why you know why does this matter? Um, you know, it, and it, it matters the most for students with phonological difficulties in that we need to be aware that intensive phonological training is a required component of reading instruction for, for, for this population of, and for, and for all kids um, to, to gain large numbers of sight words. And the number of words that you can automatically recognize is the single biggest contributor to reading fluency. You know, it's certainly it's certainly not the only contributor to reading fluency, but it is it is the biggest. So, question: Do we think that good phonics instruction is enough to build strong sight word vocabulary? Why wouldn't it be, or why would it be? So, in other words, we know that that word reading depends heavily on a child's knowledge of a wide variety of letter patterns and how to apply those and how to apply those decoding skills when reading. So is this knowledge enough for kids to be fluent readers? If anyone wants to say yes or just say a yes or a no. Nadia from the, who, I've, you're, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to respond. Nadia, if you're, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Maybe you have some, some technical issues. Did, were this, was there anyone else with their hands raised? If you'd like to uh, answer the question, you can uh, talk to Jesse. You can just raise your hand. I gotcha or anything. It's OK. Um, Seeing some no's in the Q&A. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Yes, that's, that's right. Maybe let's go on to our, um, I'm our next I'm trying to answer ones. the chat while I. Oh, yes. Um, so no, the answer is no, but systematic teaching of, of phonics is absolutely necessary, um, but not sufficient uh, for students to develop strong sight word vocabularies. So it's, a, it's an ingredient in the mix. And particularly for you know, students with phonological difficulties, where um, you know, for, for kiddos with, with those phonological core deficits, phonics helps with word decoding um, or word word identification um, but we continue to see weaker results in word reading fluency or or instant word recognition right so who's had those kids who can decode a word you know pretty accurately and sometimes not and then they and or you supply it to them and then um and then the next page they they see the word again and it's like the first time they've ever seen it and then the next day they, they see the, the same word comes up and the next week, the words continue to come up in your, in your lessons, you're spiraling up and the student continues to have to decode it 
and often laboriously and disfluently. Um, and these are our students with, who are poor orthographic mappers. So oftentimes, simply decoding a word over and over again doesn't lead to that word becoming orthographically mapped. I like to call those readers Dory readers because every time they see the word, it's like they've never seen it before. And that is a clear red flag indicator teachers that something is going on phonologically and you wanna um, investigate that further just for some like practical application. So, you know, so why is that? Why is it that a student can be taught really good systematic synthetic phonics with segmenting and blending, uh, but, they, but they still kind of decode words laboriously and, they're not, and we're not mapping those words? You know, so how does how does sight word learning really happen? So sight words are highly familiar sequences of letters, and and this and this concept of orthographic mapping, just just as an aside, you know, definitely took me many times to read the to read reading the book and thinking about it and watching videos to kind of get through my head. So you know, if this stuff is is interesting but difficult, you know, keep, keep going with it. It is totally, you know, it, it's not necessarily intuitive and not necessarily the thing that you can get the first time around. But, um, you know, the letter sequences are anchored in our memory um, via this connection between the pronunciation of the spoken word and the word spelling, right? So the individual phonemes in the words spoken pronunciation are the parking spots for the letters in the word's written form. The anchor point for recognizing every single sight word starts with the phonemes in the spoken word, not the letters. So it follows that our automaticity with immediate awareness and breaking a word down into its component phonemes and our automaticity with, with letter sound correspondences are central to this sort of connection forming process between, between our parking spots and our letters. So there are three kind of components of orthographic mapping, right? So we'll start with, with letter sound skills and that and chapter 12 is all about letter sound skills. Um, and letter, letter sound skills go well beyond kind of our knowledge of the basic 26 letters and their corresponding sounds is being able to maybe say them maybe slowly on, a, on an inventory. You know, what is needed is the unconscious automatic association of letters and letter combinations with their corresponding ranges of sounds. You know, we, we assess students who are later elementary school, middle and high school, who are still not who are still not solid with their vowel teams, with their consonant digraphs. You know, these are students who are certainly lacking, you know, letter sound proficiency. So if we have secondary folks in the, in the audience, that's never an assumption that we can make that students are set in their letter sound proficiency. Uh, phoneme awareness uh, refers to proficient and automatic access to the phonemes in spoken words. And it taps a level of, of phonemic proficiency that is a lot more advanced than what you could get in a phoneme segmentation fluency task, you know, and it and it really only tap really only tapped by this by your quick response to quick to to phoneme manipulations. That really that type of task instructionally and and in terms of assessment really taps into this level of phonemic proficiency. And then there's word study in chapter six. Um, and chapter six is fantastic. We're, we have we have a little bit of content, um, you know, at the in in this presentation, but um, has a ton of word study activities for you. And word study refers to either unconscious or the conscious process of connecting the phonemes in the spoken word to the written form of the word. And you know, word study doesn't happen unconsciously or efficiently if the if a student is lacking in phonemic awareness or letter sound skills. Uh, you know, for, for students who have difficulties in, in either of those first two components, like our students with dyslexia and mixed reading difficulties and compensators, you know, word study will not be an unconscious process and continued explicit instruction is absolutely necessary regardless of age K to, K to adulthood. 
So um, let's do a little, let's walk through a little visual of how, of how this works with um, transparent words where there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and sounds. So uh, a young child's brain is prepared to read uh, if they can pull apart a word like red. Uh, the word red already exists in their PLTM, their phonological long-term memory. They already, so they already know the pronunciation of that word, red. Um, if a, but if a student doesn't have the phonological analysis skills to pull apart that word, then they're going to have faulty information to map the letters to. So in the word, so take the, take the word drift, for example, on our third grade. You know, a child who may be in first or second or older, um, who has difficulties registering the individual phonemes in a consonant blend, as many of our students, uh, as many of our students with phonological difficulties do, um, you know, like the, like the DR and the FT in drift, they're going to have a really tough time mapping all the letters that they see to the relatively fewer chunks of sound um, that they're able to register, right? But if they can pull apart the word completely and quickly, you know, they have, good, they have a good anchoring point in their phonological long-term memory. They would then need strong letter sound knowledge to systematically translate the symbols um, in the word to the sounds, and and orthogra and um, right to, to translate the symbols to the sounds and map those to the and map them to the sounds. Um, you know, and orthographic mapping works works well with irregular words um, like has. You know, the student would just go. Oh, normally the, the S makes the S sound, but in the word has, the Z sound is represented by an S. Oh, I got it. Um, and they might, and a student who has phonemic difficulties needs that, needs that consciously um, pointed out to them through a variety of word study activities, whether it's Orton Gillingham or any number of our, of our effective um, reading instructional programs, approaches. The super interesting thing about orthographic mapping is that common sequences of letters are also orthographically mapped even when they're not real words or not whole words, right? So um, a, a young reader may map la um, at first because they've kind of used their letter sound knowledge and their phoneme awareness to or be taught to decode a word like lap or la. Right? And for this, for this reader, la becomes instantly familiar, um, and they perceive this sort of orthographic pattern in, in many of the words that they encounter. When they, when they get to the L, then the A, they don't have to decode that anymore. It just automatically registers as la. Um, and the, the process of orthographic mapping of those letter sequences grows and grows as kids get older, and will also vary depending on if they get good phonics instruction. Um, and eventually, readers' brains will recognize that that L and A also correspond to the lay sequence of sounds, um, like in later, and la, like in granola. Um, and this works with so many different subunits of words. For example, any and all of the rhyme units, R-I-M-E, um, we have listed at the bottom of this slide. And this should really kind of get us thinking about the way that we, that we classically teach quote unquote sight words in that, you know, not only can we teach students to, to orthographically map whole words, but we can and we should be integrating these smaller sequences of phonemes into our instruction. You know, so something like teaching, teaching students to automatically recognize the, the 100 most common rhyme units will unlock thousands and thousands of words for faster decoding and eventual automatic recognition. And the fantastic thing about Equip for Reading Success is that it has a list of those most, of those most common rhyme units and various word study activities that help teach them. So English also has opaque words um, that have more letters than phonemes. Um, but, but, you know, like the word make has three phonemes, m, a, k, but four letters, right? But orthographic mapping doesn't have, diff, doesn't have a problem with this. You know, so in the word make, the ache sequence of phonemes 
have the AKE sequence of letters mapped to them. Two phoneme parking spots are filled by three letters. Okay, the word read, a little different scenario, but that the, the E phoneme um, has to be mapped to two letters in the word. But with good word study instruction and the, you know, the prerequisite phonemic awareness and phonics knowledge, this shouldn't be a problem to learn. You know, and the word comb um, from a mapping standpoint is, is no different than make. Um, you know, in both cases, the same kind of adjustment is required where because the, the ohm sequence of phonemes of two, uh, you know, two phonemes has the OMB sequence of letters mapped to them. So let's talk about a little bit more about instruction and what this looks like and how to become proficient in phonological awareness. But we can't talk about effective instruction without talking about assessment first. School psychologists here, can't let it go. Um, equipped for reading success is, um, you know, has, has an, is like a, it's an assessment driven intervention program and the PAST, the phonological awareness screening test um, is the assessment that's associated with it. Um, it can be used as a standalone assessment of phonological awareness and it can also place a student really accurately on the continuum of phonological skill. Um, and it can also be used to find your start points uh, for instruction in Equipped for Reading Success. And the, the really nice thing, and, and David Kilpatrick is like the most gracious person in the world. Um, he, has made, uh, he has made the past available um, for download for free to, to be used as a standalone assessment at thepasttest.com. Um, we had a question in the chat, if you can do the past online, I do it online. Do you do it online, Jesse? I, I do do it online. Um, yeah, so the night, one of the nice things about pure phonological awareness assessment is that you don't need any manipulatives. You don't need any, any letters or books or, any, or word lists or, or things to do. It's just, it's just say some words and, and we're gonna manipulate some chunks of those words. Now you do really mean, Online remote assessment, um, you know, it has certainly has its caveats and its pitfalls. Like if your internet connection is uh, is not so great, and there's a, even a little bit um, of a lag in, in or a latency issue, you can you can miss a phoneme, which can which can really throw off your your score. So yes, optimally, yes, you can you can do the past online. So oh, make sure you have good internet connection um, and. Make sure you're in a place that's quiet when you're giving, when both the student and you are engaging in the assessment would be my tips. And also too, um, if you're in a school or if you're in a setting where you are face-to-face, -face, uh, sometimes even though I might be able to be face-to-face -face with kiddos, I wind up assessing them online anyway because of masks. Um, and if we can be at separate rooms so that we can take our masks off and be more safe in that way, then I can hear them better and they can hear me better, so. I would definitely be careful when giving the assessment face-to-face -face that your phonemes aren't skewed by your mask. Articulation is super important. Um, so the past uh, assesses early phonological skills. So at the, at the syllable level, the onset rhyme level, the basic phoneme level, and the advanced phoneme level. In the interest of time, we're just kind of showing you the, the um, we're showing you starting from the basic phoneme level. Um, and particularly because this is where the vast majority of your instruction should, um, should focus anyway. So in the basic phoneme level, we have manipulations of phonemes that are only at the beginning and end of the word, right? So phonemic awareness skills become more advanced as, as we move inward um, into the word. So let's do one of these um, to, to practice. This is an actual assessment item um, from, the, um, from the past and also can be used as an instructional activity as well. So uh, we are going to substitute the initial consonant and the beginning consonant blend. So say, say flows. Flows. Now say flows, but instead of say k. Flows. Awesome, good job. That's it. If she had, if she had gotten it wrong, I would say if, we, if you say flows and change the f to k. You get close, close, close. 
So that's at the basic volume level. At the advanced level, you know, the manipulations apply to progressively complex internal phonemes, starting, starting with substitution of something more, um, more simple like the medial short vowel in a three phoneme word, you know, manipulating that internal vowel is the most, um, the most basic internal phoneme manipulation, uh, and advancing to the most complex substitution of the internal consonant uh, sound in a consonant blend that appears at the end of a word. That's a, that is very tricky um, and, and, and definitely an advanced, um, advanced phony manipulation. So let's do a couple of these just so, just to see, you can see kind of how the, the cadence of it goes because it's really, it really should be pretty quick. Ready, Cassandra? I'm ready. All right. So uh, say kit. Kit. Now say kit. But instead of i, say a. Uh. Cut. Fantastic. Uh, now say, let's see, uh, say rhyme. Rhyme. Now say rhyme, but instead of m, say d. Rhymed. Ah, if you say rhyme and change the m to d, you get ride. Rhyme, ride. So that's, that's difficult for a lot of students. Uh, let's try this last one. Say trust. Trust. Now say trust, but instead of s, say k. Trucked. Fantastic. So um, you know, the book has, has guidance for which skills are expected depending on the student's grade level and time of the year. So we have, you know, so there's, there's definitely guidance about this. So it's, you know, these are, they're quick. Um, it's, it is once you get used to the tone and the, and the cadence and the, and the flow of the assessment, it goes by really fast. It's pretty easy. But, you know, there are a couple of really important caveats for administering the past. Um, you have to read the chapter, um, which is chapter 11, which is also available for free on the pasttest.com because you've made the, the past test available. Chapter 11 is also available on, on its administration. Um, there's also a section in chapter 12 on proper pronunciation of phonemes in isolation. Um, you know, whenever we're doing phonemic awareness assessment and instruction, sound clipping is also is, is always really, really important. You know, a lot of folks kind of inadvertently add this schwa uh, sound to their consonant sound. So instead of saying t, they say t, and instead of k, they say they may say ka, right? So, uh, but this, but adding that second phoneme, it can really, really confuse your students, uh, both in phonemic, in you know, phonemic awareness assessment and and instruction. You know, and like like with any assessment, it is really important to practice with someone first, um, and particularly someone who may be able to give you good feedback, like your like a school psychologist a speech language pathologist or another teacher or a teacher who's familiar with, with the assessment. All right. So, um, so what is, what is phonological awareness training? And so after, I think after this slide, Cassandra's gonna, gonna take you through the instructional stuff. Um, but really at the heart of it, to kind of boil it down to its most basic component, it's, it's you're guiding and instructing and scaffolding through students through increasingly complex phonological manipulations, like what we saw um, on the on those sample items of the past. Right? They require a student to make a change to the oral pronunciation of the word, either through deleting a phoneme in a word, um, or at the syllable and onset rhyme level, deleting a, a syllable or an onset rhyme, or substituting. A syllable onset rhyme or, or phoneme. For example, you know, at the one of the instructional tasks, I'd say, um, say play, play. Now say play again without saying oh. Hey. Okay, so now is the fun part for me because I'm a teacher. We're going to talk about what all this means for instruction. It's really important as an educator. Um, or as a parent or even as an advocate to understand the science behind all of this, but then be able to take it into practice, which is kind of what Jesse and I do best as we bridge that research to practice um, gap that we talked about at the beginning. 
So there are a couple of components when we're training PA um, to mastery. The first thing that we wanna do is we wanna directly instruct skills that kids don't know. And I'm gonna show you how you could do that online in a little bit with an example instructional routine. The other thing that we do is once you give the, the past, you actually get two levels for kids. You get a level where they're correct, but they're not yet automatic. So they can't say it within two seconds, right? That's what we do. By we, we mean Dr. Kilpatrick. Clearly we love him just so much. Um, uh, within two seconds. And then there's lots of incidental teaching moments that you can do throughout the day. You can embed phonemic manipulations into your read aloud when you know that a word lends itself to that. And you can even pepper these one minute activities, which we'll learn about in a little bit um, throughout your school day. Um, some of you may have been around long enough to remember when we did seven days to multiplication, when you would ask a kid a multiplication fact before they would get up to go to the restroom, you can pepper your day the same way that you do. So you could say, say the word ghost, now say ghost, but don't say s, and the kid would say goat. And then you could say, go to the restroom. Um, it's a nice way to pepper it throughout your day. And if you're doing this at home, um, these one minute activities are super fun just to do randomly. Even though Patrick is 16 and fully remediated, he still struggles with the more advanced phoneme levels. And sometimes in the car, we like to do a little phoneme play at that one minute level. So what does this look like? Oh, another note, a very important note. Phonemic awareness should not be taught for 20 or 30 minutes. We are talking a 10 minute section of your day. Um, what we like to say when we work with teachers is like the juice is not worth the squeeze. Even though this is really good stuff and even though this is critically important to do with kiddos, you will not get the return on your time investment if you extend it to 30 minutes. Okay, so direct teaching of phonological awareness. What does this look like? In the book, Kilpatrick um, lays out an instructional routine that I have modified as an educator only so slightly. Um, and the first thing that you do is you do a direct explanation of the task that you want kids to do using student-friendly language and the vocabulary of, nap of mapping, not napping, sorry. Um, and I like to call this the name a thing a thing part, right? It's where you tell kids exactly what you're gonna have them do and you use that rich vocabulary of foundational skills instruction so that they can then repl replicate what you're doing later. Um, then you're gonna model directly for them. How are they doing the work? You're gonna show them, right? And then you're gonna take them through a series of practice with feedback, this is where I modified it, um, gradually releasing the responsibility to them as you go on. So you're gonna provide them lots of opportunities to self-correct and, and also provide direct feedback. You are not going to give that, you're not going to let them go without them ending on success. That's critically important. We don't wanna teach kids how to do things the wrong way. So um, here are some, some sample instructional tasks that you might do at the syllable level. These are right out of the one minute activities in the equipped book, which there's a big appendix. So I, I love this book so much because it's kind of pricey for a book, but when you think about it like a curriculum, it's a really good deal especially given what it can do for kids. So something that you might do at the syllable level is say the word bookcase. Bookcase. Now say bookcase, but don't say case. Book. Um, or at the onset rhyme level, say the word feet. Feet. Now say feet, but don't say f. Feet. Right. So looking at these more complex texts, tasks at the basic phoneme level and the advanced phoneme level, I actually want to switch screens on you for a little bit and show you a really cool resource and a really good way to teach it online. That was something that came up in the chat and also something that we do a lot with teachers. Um, unfortunately, this resource is only available for another two weeks, um, but it's not incredibly expensive if you want to keep it going. It's the really great reading um, letter tile free play. I love it for so many reasons, not just for teaching PA. It's got every possible letter tile that you could want, including um, onset and or rhyme chunks. So I really like this. But for our purposes today, we'll stay in PA and we won't go into phonics. And um, we'll be looking at these colored swatches right here. It's a way that we can add that multi-sensory component um, when we're providing direct instruction to students. Uh, positive, we can provide a nice model with these and we can add a scaffold. 
negative. I haven't quite figured out how to see what the students do unless they share their screen with you and you're watching. So an instructional routine could look a little something like this at the basic phoneme level. All right, say the word drip. Drip. How many phonemes do we hear in the word drip? Let's count them. Watch me and count along. D, er, e. How many did we count? Four. Four, that's right. I counted four too. So let's bring down the colored tiles to rep represent those sounds. Let's say them as we bring them out. D, er, e. Nice, we have all our sounds. Today, we are going to change the first phoneme in the word drip. What color tile represents that first phoneme in the word drip? That is red. Yeah, it's the red one. What sound is on that red tile? <laughs> That's right. Let's touch and say the whole word again before we make the change. Ready? Drip. Now we're going to get rid of that first sound and we're going to add the sound g. So let's pull down a tile to represent that. What sound was that? G. The g sound. Okay. G. Let's touch and say, here we go. G. G. Er. E. Grip. Grip. I didn't even have to tell you. You said it fast. Nice job. All right. So that's what it could look like. Obviously, you know your kids best, you'll know what scaffolds to use. And then at the advanced phoneme level, um, following the same type of instructional routine, we would do um, a different type of manipulation. So I'm gonna apply a little less of a scaffold to Jesse on this one, just so you can see what it looks like. Say the word ghost. 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 How many phonemes do you hear in the word ghost? O, S, T, four. Yeah, I agree, that's four. Let's pull down four tiles. Say those as I pull them down. O. S. Oh, sorry. Yeah, what was that word again? Ghost. All right, now we're gonna delete the first phoneme in that ST blend. Touch that first phoneme in that ST blend and tell me the color that you see. First phoneme in the ST consonant blend, it is g o s t s. That's the blue. That's right. We're going to get rid of it. We're going to say goodbye. S goodbye. S and we're going to bring this over. What sounds do we have left? G o t goat. That's right. When we get rid of the s in ghost, we get goat. Nice job. So that's just an example of how you might wanna do that online. I, um, I find that a very helpful resource. And we had some questions on that in the chat. Okay, so that is where you're gonna be instructing. So that's their level where they don't have it correct and they don't have it at automaticity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. So that is your direct instruction piece. After you do your direct instruction piece, actually, I like to do it before and after, just I like to get the brain going, do my direct instruction, and then close it out on success. You're going to want to do your one minute activities. This is the main tool for developing it from correct to automatic. And remember, automaticity is where we want to be. We want them to be able to do it within that two seconds. Um, I love these one minute activities because kids absolutely adore doing them. It's something that they're very successful with. And so it's a nice reinforcement activity. Another thing I like about it is it's a good temperature check, right? So let's say you give the assessment and you put a kiddo as this is their one minute activity and they're struggling with it. That just lets you know it's not their one minute activity level and you just go back to direct instruction. Um, I like to tell my teachers and my parents that I work with like, no children were harmed in phonological awareness instruction. As long as you're making your sounds clearly, you can always go back and reteach if you find that um, you didn't level them correctly, which is one of the things I really like about this program. All right, so some things to remember, and I've kind of mentioned this already. Students should be working on two levels of the program at the same time. 
one where they're developing automaticity, that should be your one minute activities, and one that's more difficult where you're walking them through um, those four steps, the direct teaching and the practice with feedback. I already talked about how you can punctuate your school day and how you could do incidental teaching. You can do this in large or small group. Um, some classrooms in our district in the K-1 level, they do the, the one minute activities in some of the teachers large group. I prefer it in small group, obviously. But um, again, it, it won't harm children that aren't at that level to hear that, but we would just encourage teachers not to um, call on them directly if it's not their level and not to um, hold them accountable for knowing that if they're not there yet. All right, so why are they so effective? I think we've talked about this a lot today, but that phonological manipulation, isolating, segmenting, blending um, are the tools that promote orthographic mapping, right? Why I love them as a teacher is that they take almost no planning time. Um, once you get used to the instructional routine, you can really do this quickly and effectively. Um, there's many opportunities to provide interactions and reinforcement in a short amount of time. It's built in ongoing progress monitoring. Again, as a teacher, that's something I really love. And I cannot stress enough how happy kids are when they do them and they really do them well and they end on success. And I could see on Jesse's face, he wanted to correct me on something. So go ahead. Just a quick point about, about phonological manipulation. Um, manipulation, a manipulation task, like we saw with ghost to goat, um, encompasses segmentation, isolation, and blending all within one task. It's the reason why it's an advanced, um, it's an advanced phonological skill compared to the, to the basic skills of segmentation, isolation, and blending, right? So when you do something like changing ghost to goat, in order to do that, you first, we first had to segment that word ghost into its component phonemes, isolate the, um, the phoneme that, that the teacher wanted us to isolate, make the switch or, or make the deletion, and then re-blend those phonemes back together. So within one manipulation task, you have three, phon three phonemic tasks, which is what makes this, this training, um, this type of training activity really, really effective. Couldn't agree more. Um, a couple of questions in the chat I just want to address before we move on. Um, someone asked me if we found a good way to make sure that kids are hearing the sounds appropriately if you're masked and in person. So this happened to me Thursday. Um, I was working with a group of kids in person and they were really just not doing well on their one minute activity. Um, and it turns out it's because my mask was too close to my face. And so my sound was really muffled. So I washed my hands and I took my mask and I just made some space on the side of my mask so that the sound could come out and that worked better. Some of my colleagues have bought those, um, what they call them lipstick savers. I don't know what they're called, I'm so sorry. But they're little um, silicone domes that you can put inside of your mask that push the mask out and your sounds are significantly clearer if the mask is not up against your face. It's not perfect, but it works. Um, and then someone else asked if the 10 minute rule applies to, oh, somebody has a, a little example. It looks like this. Um, somebody asked if the 10 minute rule applies to older readers. Um, yes. Again, it's like, like nothing bad will happen if you go to 12 minutes, but that's a general rule of thumb. So yeah, that applies to all readers. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a hard 10 minute time yeah. limit there. If you're, if you're in the middle of a task and a student is about to get some, yeah, take 15 minutes to, to, yeah. to, to, to scaffold them through. But we're just talking about um, not, do, not making phonemic awareness the point of your entire like 30 minute um, instructional group. There needs to be multiple components of of your of reading in your in your interventions and your small groups, and and get into awareness that. can be like a smaller chunk. Yep, and we'll get into that in a little bit because you'll see how these activities have to be applied um, with letter study and word study as well. So we'll we'll get into that. I think that's all the questions. I just wanted to make sure since we were talking instruction that those questions got answered. Oh, another tip if you're working at home or if you're working at a school, because kids enjoy these and because it's so reinforcing, because they make progress and they're 
um, having a good time, I would recommend setting a timer for 10 minutes because it is very easy to go over 10 minutes because people are um, enjoying themselves and kids are being successful. So just a little instructional note there. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about the, the word study activities uh, that appeared in the book. Um, you know, the, we, there are a couple of things that we really wanna keep in mind. The general principle of these, in, of these activities that they, is that they explicitly point out the relationship between the sequence of phonemes in the spoken pronunciation with the order of the letters in the words written form. You know, and in order for that relationship to begin making sense, students have to be at that basic level of phonemic awareness um, and to be able to do basic segmentation of words into their phonemes. Okay, so they also have to have good letter sound skills since these activities assume that, that students have mastered basic letter sound correspondences, which is an assumption that we certainly shouldn't make um, of, of our students, regardless of their age. So this is just a caveat that Dr. Kilpatrick puts in there um, to say like, if, if, um, if that's the case for your student, these word study strategies may not work too well and they need some more remedial instruction in basic phoneme skills and letter sound correspondences before we can do these word study activities. Um, so the to go back to something that Cassandra had had said about the first thing to do in these, um, you know, in these activities is to use the specific vocabulary for the concepts that you're teaching. Right? We all learn best when we have labels attached to the concepts that we're learning. Right. So using this like precise vocabulary helps students sharpen their thinking. It helps them communicate more clearly, uh, and it and it really just like first and foremost allows them to word, look at words more analytically. Like the fact that there are exact definitions of these things, you know, and talking to students about them has a way of explicitly showing them that there's tons of structure around the way that words work, right? And this is something that is like desperately needed for students who has, for students who've been like taught unsystematically or for students for whom sequences of sounds don't make sense due to phonological difficulties. So we want to call an onset and rhyme an onset and rhyme. We want to call a consonant blend a consonant blend. So we're, we're going to say, today we're going to delete the second consonant in a consonant blend that appears at the beginning of a word. A consonant blend is when two consonants come together, but they retain both of their sounds. Right? We're going to, we can delete one to make a new word. So we want to be really explicit. Um, with our language. So uh, the first one that, that we wanted to point out, and there are over 20 of these word study activities, so we're not gonna have time to go through it each and one, each and every one. We picked out some of the more interesting ones uh, that we wanted to tell folks about. Um, you know, these are so, all in chapter six. Perfect. Um, so phonics instruction, teaches students to go from letters to sounds, right? To decode written words. Uh, but in order to become proficient in orthographic mapping, it's important for students to actually master the reverse and go from sound to grapheme, right? A grapheme is just one or more letters that represent one phoneme. You know, so with an activity called phoneme grapheme mapping, the teacher orally introduces a phoneme or if we're, if we're on the more, if we're working in more complex skills, they'll orally introduce a rhyme unit or a sequence of phonemes. And the student must choose which one appears, uh, what, which one corresponds to that on a card in front of them. And they have a number of other graphemes or rhyme units as, as distractors. So that one that you're also going to ask them about. You know, like, like with all other structured literacy and word study kind of techniques, you know, the name of the game here is moving from simple to complex. So, you know, this might look like you know, when you're first working with students with single letter graphemes, right? So I point, uh, point to the s or point to the grapheme that makes the s sound or point to the grapheme that, that makes the old sound. Then more complex letter, uh, more or like multi-letter graphemes like digraphs um, or vowel teams 
and then followed by like rhyme units and, and blends and prefixes and suffixes. You know, which one says pre, which one says shun, which one says ints. You know, these are re these can be really powerful stuff. Uh, a look the look-alike word strategy is one where a teacher shows the student a group of words that all have a very similar visual look to them on flashcards, and student must accurately kind of rattle off each each word. And this has a way of forcing students to attend to every letter in the word learning, which both reinforces mapping and also combats the really, really poor sort of um, reading strategies that, that, that they might be bringing because of some previously poor instruction. So, you know, I might say hit, hat, hut, hot, had, ham, has, his, hey, how, right? Um, and then you can, and as students are more proficient readers, obviously your students have to have some, uh, uh, you know, a basic or, or moderate level of reading proficiency to be able to identify these words. So that's a, that's a prerequisite to this lookalike word strategy. But once they do, and you're still seeing those kind of, um, so look at the first, look at the first letter or letters and say the first thing that comes to mind type of, uh, type of strategies, this lookalike word strategy is really, can be really effective. And on the next slide, uh, you know, it, just to, just to kind of reinforce this combats those, those most common sort of compensating strategies that are reinforced by three queuing systems. So if your student has been taught to look at the first, to look at the first letter or the first two letters and then look at the picture or does that look right, does that sound right um, type of thing, this has a really strong way of, of reorienting their attention just to using the letters, the sequence of letters in the words to decode the word. Because you know none of that none of that stuff will work on this type of activity. Uh, there is backward decoding, and backward decoding can seem really kind of counterintuitive. So give me a little leeway here in, in explaining this to you. And what it is not is is it's not reading words backwards, graphing by graphing. That's that's not effective. But backward decoding um, is reading the the ending rhyme unit first then the onset, right? And a bit of linguistics can kind of explain why reading the rhyme unit first is actually more consistent with how our mental recall system for words uh, work compared to, to something like classic left to right decoding. So our, our mental rec uh, recall system for oral words is actually rec uh, organized according to the first sound and then the rhyming pattern. Um, and so how we know this is true um, is that it's actually so much easier to rattle off a bunch of, of spoken words that share the same first sound, like sit, sat, song, soon, soon. Um, and it's really easy to rattle off uh, words that share the same rhyme unit, like sat, hat, pat, rat, mat. But check out how slow it, it might, it'll take you when I ask you to rattle off a bunch of words that have the same middle sound. Like send me all the words that you can that you can name that have the e eh sound in the middle. Pen, uh, pent, send, red, right? So significantly slower. So our brains find that quite a bit more difficult because um, because just by by just focusing on the middle sound, we're actually breaking up that naturally patterned rhyme unit. And kind of throwing our brains off, right? So when younger children and children with reading difficulties decode sound by sound from left to right, like in the word tap, for example, you know, when you get to t a, you've split that rhyme unit and lost the benefit of a potentially powerful organizational principle that's built into our memory system. Um, and, that's, and that's a benefit that's preserved in having them read the rhyme unit first. Right, so covering up that, covering up the onset, and having them read, read app, and then adding the t tap. Now, to be clear, we are certainly not advocating for students to read all of their words like that. This is just this is this is something like an error correction strategy when a student maybe makes a makes an error on a word where it is appropriate to do it, but certainly certainly not uh, replacing left to right decoding by any means. So don't get the wrong idea there. Um, 
But backward decoding also um, can work with certain multisyllable words as well. Definitely not all of them, particularly not with words that contain lots of irregularities. Um, but it does work well, though, with multisyllable words that have all closed syllables, which are a ton of words in the English language. You know, so reading and mapping the word carpenter, for example, could be a struggle for a lot of students, right? Um, but we can, we can cover up all but that last rhyme unit, er, and we made sure to teach that well with R sound. Um, then we're blending in the onset for that last syllable, ter, then adding the second to last rhyme, enter, and the second to last onset, penter, and so on with arpenter and carpenter. You know, and this is, um, this is a really effective strategy for students who read those first letter or letters in a word and then say the first thing that comes to mind again. Again, it forces students to attend to all of the meaningful units um, in the word. But again, just a, a caveat about backward decoding is that we really need to use our judgment with this technique since it will not work well with, with lots of multisyllabic words. Uh, a rhyme unit wall. This one I really like because the, the concept of a word wall is, you know, can be very problematic. Um, and we'll end to leave it at that. You know, so as you, as you teach kids the different rhyme units, and like on page 250 of Equip for Reading Success, I have all of the 100 most common, common ones, we put them up on a rhyme unit wall in place of a word wall. They can be organized by, by their vowel sound. And we can, do, we can do manipulations on the rhyme units to help facilitate them. We can, we can build them into, into multiple components uh, of, our, of, our group, of our small group instruction. So, um, you know, Equipped for Reading Success has a, you know, it gives a, a, a couple of sample lesson plans uh, for, you to, for you to teach for students who are ready for those word study activities. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the sample 30 minute lesson plans. You can see that it is certainly not, you know, just, fun, just phonemic awareness and or phonological awareness work. Um, but in order for a student to be ready for the word study activities, they can't be working on basic phonological skills. They have to be making progress to those basic phoneme skills. So we start out with a one minute activity. Then we, uh, then we for, to build fluency and to build fluency in an, in a, on one level. Then we go into a, a, a higher level um, in the program where the student is not able, is not accurate yet, and we and we teach. Um, we review the vocabulary of the of the um, of that particular level. Um, then we move into reviewing rhyme units, either on the word wall or flashcards. Um, we are not not big fans of putting whole words on flashcards and teaching students to read whole words by um, by rote memory, but rhyme units. And after they have been taught and phonemically manipulated and the student is aware of each of the, um, this, the phonemes in those, flashcards can be a very powerful tool for, for something like that. Then we're doing another one minute activity, uh, then a couple of word study, uh, a couple of word study um, activities for about two to four minutes. Then we are rolling into, into connected text reading with comprehension, comprehension and vocabulary support. And then we're capping it all off with a one minute activity. So that, that's what this could look like. I think it's really important to reinforce that like, as you see the phonological component of it is only that 10 minute piece that we talked about, but then you then have to connect it with word study and then bring it down into text. Just doing the phonological component alone is not gonna get you where you need to go. So Equipped for Reading Success also has, um, has a lot to say about feedback um, during oral reading. And you know, Dr. Kilpatrick is very explicit in saying at the beginning of, the, at the beginning of this section, saying that oral, re oral reading with feedback leads to reading gains according to the National Reading Panel, but silent reading does not lead to reading gains for students with reading difficulties. They are either avoiding reading in general and, and just pretend reading or reading and actually practicing errors and practicing ineffective reading. And to give feedback um, that corrects every oral reading mistake, not just the ones that 
that affect meaning or comprehension. Uh, the next question is, well, what, you know, if what I'd be correcting them all the time, you know, they, I, they couldn't be get through a text. Well, if they are making that many mistakes, then that might, it might be a little bit too difficult for that particular task. Uh, you know, and easy, maybe we want to use easier material to reinforce reading skill. So we have a couple of pieces of guidance here for when a student makes an error, right? So uh, introducing the word orally first, right? Speech to print or phonemes to graphemes, then doing some segmentations, some manipulations on that word and calling their attention uh, to the sequence of phonemes in the word and, 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 and how the sequence of letters corresponds to that. We'll do so we could do some backwards decoding on it if it can be chunked by onset rhyme. Many times it may, it may not be, so can't use that all the time. Um, you know, saying the oral parts of the word and having the students identify which letters in the word represent those phonemes or rhyme units or other word parts and going out of order could be helpful. Um, and then if it is an irregular word, pointing out all the irregularities in the word and drawing attention to just a few irregular letter sound correspondences. There's been um, a lot of talk about, about heart word routines and teaching and teaching high frequency words with this uh, or irregular words with this in mind. Like in this, in, for example, said and from, you know, out of, in the word said, out of the three phonemes, there's only one phoneme that is irregularly represented um, by, the a, by the AI letter. Uh, but the S and the D are totally, totally normal. Same thing with from. Out of the four phonemes, there's only one phoneme in there that's irre irregularly represented. So these things can be taught. They don't, I mean, we should absolutely not be teaching them as whole words. We need more fine-grained phonic and phonemic analysis rather than less. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about how to teach those words using that heart word routine, there's really great reading, has a lot of the hard word resources. Thank you, videos. Uh, all right. Well, that so, brings us to the end. Cassandra, go ahead. Yes, sir. I thought we'd do a little Q&A because there were some questions about instruction. I don't know if you want to um, review some of the stuff in the chat. I'll address what I, um, what I feel like relates to teachy stuff, um, as I like to call it. So one of the questions was, um, what do we suggest for the connected reading at the end? Does it need to be um, skills that were explicitly taught earlier to provide like practice or can it be interest-based or motivation-based? Um, I would say that in the beginning, we definitely want it to be all things like decodable text and words that they've encountered before because we're practicing. Um, but we want kids to have a variety of experience with text. And so depending upon how they progress with their word reading, um, you could add non-controlled text in there, but be ready to support them through it, right? And helping them um, provide, providing them with like making sure they're attending to the vowels, remembering the strategies that you've given them in the word study, like backwards decoding, et cetera. Um, so like most things in education, sometimes and sometimes no. Um, let me see if I, I see a, um, someone had asked a question, how does this, how does this fit in with the new BEST standards emphasis on, on background knowledge over skills? Um, I, think, I think maybe that might be a, um, a misconception or a misinterpretation of the BEST standards because there are, there are, there are phonological awareness skill uh, standards in the BEST standards um, as well as building background knowledge and vocabulary. So the, the two you know, these are not mutually exclusive by any means. I mean, I think there's a lot of popular misconception about that. Um, you know, we can, the best reading instruction for a student is, is one that, that teaches explicit skills, like the stuff in Equipped for Reading Success, but we're also, but we're also building rich background knowledge and academic vocabulary and other oral language skills. And also how to teach students to use, how, they're, how we're using uh, those those foundational skills to access grade level text, right? So they, they are not mutually exclusive at all by any means. Jesse, may I interrupt for a second on that question? Absolutely. Because I think perhaps what the uh, participant was referring to is that 50% of reading being um, 
um, what do I want to say, uh, fiction or nonfiction or literature based versus decodables or phonics based instruction. So I think to answer that, because um, we've had a few conversations with Just Read Florida and the DOE, and I believe the teachers can actually use reading to students to build up that knowledge and background, you know, experiences, not necessarily having their students, particularly the students who are struggling with reading, read those books themselves. So that way it's um, actually, you know, incorporating both the decoding using the decodables and also te teacher read alouds would provide that background, the, you know, the information they talk about in the book, the knowledge gap, you know, to provide that, that content information. I'm not sure if that helped, but I just wanted to put that in there. Oh, thank you, Judy. That's that's fantastic. I appreciate that. That's great clarification. Oh, someone also shared that the UFLY Teaching Hub has great resources for heart words. We agree. Um, that's a great place yes. to go. Oh, sorry. I'm just trying to read the chat questions to see if there's anything we can answer because we don't want to leave you with any more wonderings than you need to. Cassandra, are you able to post the UFLY website? Um, if not, we can add it to our um, information that we provide at the end, okay? Because some people may not be familiar with that, and it really is a very good resource. Yes. I'll compile a series of things that we can send out at the end, like the really great reading, letter tile, playground, and things like that. I'll work on that. Perfect. Thank you. So maybe let's, let's talk about um, the follow-up for our book study, because we... And then, and then at the end, we can we can loop back around to the questions. So this was this was just kind of a a, a dip of the toe into the into the very deep pool that is equipped for reading success. So we didn't have the opportunity to get into you know quite a bit of the content. So um, we're going to have three follow up book study nights. Um, they are going to be on Thursdays. We have the dates here from six to seven, uh, where. We'll be covering the various routine, the you know various topics that we wanted to um, that we wanted to get into more depth about, um, but didn't maybe have the the bandwidth here. So um, there will be uh, there will be Zoom links that will be coming out um, in the future about this, but we wanted everyone to have this um, you know to have this information. They'll will be they'll be recorded um, and put up on uh, you know in the, in the same outlet as the recording of. Uh, this presentation as well. And they'll be way more interactive than this. We'll have lots of rich discussion and lots of sharing about our experiences. Um, this was just to kind of send you off to the book study with um, good background knowledge so you can have a deeper, more meaningful experience with the text. And particularly about the instructional routines because we really, we didn't, we, we we didn't give it, we didn't, hardly didn't give any information about that. And, and that was, you know, on purpose, because this, it does, it does require, you know, some back and forth and answering specific questions. I'm excited for that night. It's my favorite part. So um, to purchase the book. So our first, the first night um, is what, uh, November 5th. So we wanted to set it out uh, a little farther to give every, if you don't have the book now, to give you some time to purchase the book if you'd like and for it to be shipped. Uh, this book is like sweeping the nation. It's really crazy how popular it is. I mean, not, not crazy at all. It's like, it's one of the best books on reading instruction I've ever read. Um, so you can find it at equippedforreadingsuccess.com and there's also um, the Reading League also has a, an, an, a, a place to buy the book as well. And we uh, there. Stay on to the end, you might be one of the five lucky participants who receive a free copy and please complete the survey. And also thank you for this slide. Remember, if you join IDA at the professional level, the first 20 members who join, and by the way, if you become a member of IDA and you're a Florida resident, then you automatically become a member of IDA Florida branch. Okay, but you must be a Florida resident. So um, that's just another incentive to receive a copy of this book. So you can tell how we all think it's one of the best resources out there and we are trying to support, you know, getting this information to each and every one of you. When you, and just to, to piggyback on that, when you become a member of the International Dyslexia Association, you also get access to a ton of resources from IDA. They have, they have their own quarterly journal called Perspectives on Language and Literacy, which is a must read. It is, it is a wealth 
of knowledge every single, and oh, actually, I, sh I shouldn't say, I don't know if it's quarterly. Is it, is it quarterly? Um, however often it is, it's, it's a couple of times a year, but it is fantastic. Always enlightening, always eye-opening, always directly relevant to, to my practice. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything else to add, Cassandra or uh, Jesse? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, on our uh, on our next slide, we uh, just to give a quick plug. Mm -hmm. um, we are. I want to encourage everyone to join us at two o'clock today for an information about the establishment of a Florida chapter of the Reading League, which is a um, which is an allied organization to IDA. Okay, so we have the the link there. We will be starting a, a Florida chapter um, in the in the near future, and we want to get the we want to get the word out. Um, Laura Stewart, who you might have, who you may have seen in other in other webinars talking about the science of reading, um, will be will be leading a discussion, and then you'll be and we'll kind of introduce ourselves there. So um, if you have the if you have the bandwidth and the time, please join us. We'd love to have you. And that's it. That's it for me. And that's it. All right. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody for your attendance at today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we all did. Um, if you have any questions that weren't answered in the Q&A or would like to receive more information regarding the science of reading, structured literacy, dyslexia, reading success, um, feel free to contact us at our website. And um, we already let you know about the book study and about joining IDA. So unless anyone has any further questions, thank you again so much and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye, thank you. Thanks everyone, we appreciate your time. Bye.